Would you join me if we open in prayer? Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to come and lift your name up before men. For you said, where I'm lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And Lord, this is our prayer tonight, that all men would be drawn unto you. For this world in which we live today, in just a short lifetime, my lifetime, what a tremendous change I've seen with these eyes in our society. I lift up this great nation to you, Father. No nation on earth has ever been so blessed as this nation. And yet so many people so ungrateful for the blessings that we have today. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for these blessings on this nation and upon our people. And Lord, I plead for them today, those who are asleep, that somehow you might shake them away. That they can understand where we stand on the road map of God. Thank you, Father, for this forum that you have provided here those that work so hard to keep this light shining, especially Brother Glenn and all those that work with him these many years. We lift them up to you and we ask that special blessing tonight for each and every one. We ask that you be in charge of this meeting, Father, and every word said, every done, every deed done, every thought passed on. Let them all come together to bring him to glory to the kingdom of God. We call on you to rebuke the devourer to not be able to interfere with what's said and done here tonight. In your precious name, amen and amen. 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 For well, our first scripture reading tonight, we want to turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 103. <clears throat> bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all of thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord. This verse of scripture has a tremendous amount of latter day truth in it. We know who heals all of our diseases, who restores all our body. But you know, I was fascinated for years with that fifth verse there. I want to read that fifth verse again. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. What was he talking about? The way of the eagle, like the eagle. How did the eagle really renew his So I got in a tremendous amount of research on this very same thing. And praise the Lord, after quite some time, we got a new book coming out. It's entitled The Way of the Eagle. And uh, it answers many questions about divine healing. Is divine healing of sickness a part of the modern ministry of the church today? Does God really want us to be healed? If divine healing is part of God's plan today, then why do some seemingly godly good people never get healed? What really brings on sickness in the human body? These are all legitimate questions and all answered in Scripture. It is important for all Christians to know what Scripture says in relation to these Scriptures. How does the eagle renew his youth? Is it possible that that can happen? The first thing we want to deal with is what really causes sickness in the human body. Now, from our research in scripture, it's quite obvious that what uh, uh, the problem of uh, sickness and disease is interlaced with the problem of sin and death. All of which is the result of the fall of mankind. However, medical science looks at sickness and disease as a physiological or psychosomatic problem. Now the Bible presents two scriptural causes as a basis for all sickness. Both of those causes are spiritual. Number one, sin. The Bible says in James 1.15 that when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. 
In most cases, death is a result of personal sin. However, in my study through Scripture, I discovered that such thing is a national sin, which can literally cause national or corporate death. An example of this is found in <coughs> Psalms 7, uh, chapter 78, verse 49 and 50. We read that. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and trouble. By sending evil angels among them, he made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to pestilence. Psalms 78, verse 49 and 50. Here, the Bible was talking about the destruction of a whole race of people for their national sin. It was the Egyptians who had held the Hebrew people captive for those years, and this entire race of Egyptians died in a period of 400 years. Now, for two gross perverted sins, and, and uh, the society as a whole was condemned because they failed to condemn these sins. And therefore, God used demon spirits to spread amongst the population of those people catastrophic illnesses. Back in the late 80s, the Manchester University undertook a project of trying to determine the cause of the death of that entire race of people in a 400 year period. Dr. Rosalie David of Manchester University was appointed head of that committee and after they had examined those mummified bodies that died during that time they released their report and a synopsis of it was published in the Southern Science Journey which I have a copy of here. They concluded that all of those people died from catastrophic illnesses that are common to us today. And here we have evidence, the fact that demons were used to spread the catastrophic illnesses among that population. And their sin for which God destroyed them, and for which he, he destroyed the, even those people that didn't participate in it, the two sins that he wiped out this entire population for, number one was incest, Number two was bestility. When Dr. Rosalie David and their committee unearthed these mummified bodies to examine them, they were buried with the figurines that depicted their gods and depicted their way of life at that time. And those figurines are on display today in the Museum of Modern History in Cairo, Egypt, where they were placed there, which shows the lifestyle that they used. And this society was condemned for their failure to oppose it, just as the uh, uh, 20th chapter of Leviticus, verse 1 through 6, says, if we hide our eyes from these gross sins, God will make us guilty of them. We don't have to participate in them. All we have to do is hide our eyes from them. When we, we are compelled to call sin, sin, Amen. no matter how much it hurts people that hear it. You know, some people don't want to hear it. They don't want to be told that sin is sin. Well, we see that is a result of a national sin or where society itself was judged to be guilty of the very thing that, every, that, that uh, many of the people were. A lot of people didn't participate in those two things, but they uh, accepted it as a lifestyle what we are being employed every day to accept as a lifestyle, yeah. an owner's lifestyle, right? yeah. placing that owner's day by day, right. to accept that, not to oppose it. Right. Well, <clears throat> you see what happened? It brings Tolerance. the judgment of God down on people that do it. <clears throat> the word is tolerance. Amen. That's the word. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in the field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and sell all that he hath, 
and buy that field again. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking a goodly pearl, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 through 46. What is the greatest treasure you can possess here on earth? Physical. I'm not talking about salvation. That's the greatest possession any human being can possess. But the treasure we're looking for while we're trying to serve our God. We have to say, of course, we seek after good health. Strength. That gives us the ability to do that. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7 says, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes was not down, nor his natural forces abated. Hmm. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural forces are vacant. He walked to his grave. Did you know that? He walked to God, told him where to go, where his grave was. And he walked to it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all walk to our grave? You know, the Bible said in Hebrew 9.27, it is appointed unto all men once to die. And after death, the judgment. So that means we all want to have to die. Aren't we? But you know, I've searched this Bible from front to back. I've found a single place that said you got to die sick. That's right. Yeah. 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 You don't have to die sick. Right. you got to die, but you don't have to die sick. So, <clears throat> we can even... We can even extend our life. Did you know that? Beyond the appointed time that we have. Did you know the Bible says we can do that? Well, sure it does. It says, as I said in Hebrew 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this judgment. Now look, <clears throat> we can extend our life or we can shorten it. See? The Bible says, be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? You can die before your appointed time. Ecclesiastes uh, 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 7, 17 says, you can die before your time. So why die before your time? He said, you're foolish if you do. That's what he's saying right here. Be not foolish. Because you can die before your time. Now, he says, <clears throat> And if thou will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David, then I will lengthen thy days. You see, you can add time to your life. You have two options on your life. Number one, you can cut it short. Number two, you can lengthen it. The Bible is very clear. We have an example. <clears throat> King Hezekiah had his life expand extended by 15 years go and say to hezekiah thus saith the lord thy god of david thy father i have heard thy prayer i have seen thy tears behold i will add unto thy life 15 years isaiah chapter 38 verse 5 god extended his life by 15 years i stand before you today living proof i met my appointed time to die August 3rd, 1979, in an ambulance when God supernaturally revealed to me that that day, that time, that moment was my time to die. 20, almost 27 years ago, and I'm still here. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. He brought me here. He brought me here. Not because of me, oh no. It was in spite of me. Somebody said, why would he do that for you? Why not somebody that the world would know and the world would respect? Well, I think he probably couldn't find a sorry human being on earth than me. And that's why he did it. Because I could never say I did it. I could never say it was because of me. I could never say how good I was. I deserved it. I could never say that. It was all because for some reason 
God had pity on me. And he wanted me. He wanted me to do it. So here I am. How would you like to walk to your grave like Moses did? Amen. What kind of... You know, we all have to take... We all, you know... I think I read the other day somewhere for how many millions of dollars that are spent in the United States every year for sleeping pills. Millions of dollars spent on sleeping pills. People couldn't go to sleep. They couldn't rest. And they bought some kind of pill to put them to sleep. What if we could find a pill, a miracle pill, like the pill that puts your people in one that would actually bring us on Moses-like health? Would we sell all that we own to get it? Like the... <clears throat> Merchant in pearls, or the man that found the treasure in the field. They sold everything they had just to get it. Boy, if we could find one pill, if we could find one pill that would bring us Moses like him, sure we'd sell everything we own, wouldn't we, to get that pill? Well, there is a pill. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have to sell anything to get it. It's called the gospel. And it's free to those who find it. You know? It'll cure all manner of sickness. It restores Moses like health and adds years to your life. And it even renews your youth. All right, yeah. Like the eagle. Oh, yes, like the eagle. But now, you know, when you go to the doctor and he gives you a prescription, you take the prescription to the drugstore. And if the druggist can decipher, decipher it and read it, he, he will then fill that prescription. And sometimes he has to take different chemicals or, or uh, these things, and he adds them, mixes them together in proper proportion and puts them in a little capsule or a pill, and you take that medicine the doctor's ordered. Well, now, this gospel is made up of, of seven different ingredients. And you've got to have all seven of them to make it work. And it'll work if you got them all. The first is the Word. This Word. God's Word. And it becomes the basis for all of this. The second one is the binder that holds them together. And it's called faith. Faith plus attitude. The third one is forgiveness. You're not going to get anything from God until you forgive. You forgive. That's important. That has to be there. The fourth one is persistence plus patience. Oh, the Bible said patience is so important that in Luke 1921 said, In your patience possess ye your soul. Wow. How important is that? And he said, if you don't have patience, I'll send you tribulation. That work is patience. <laughs> Praise God, I got plenty. <laughs> don't mean no more. Number five is prayer and supplication. Okay. Number seven is wisdom. Six. Six. Wisdom. Godly wisdom. And the Bible said that wisdom is built on seven pillars. Seven pillars. They are fear of God, love for wisdom, truth, understanding, which is knowledge, prudence, counsel, and righteousness. These now are the ingredients you need to put them all together. You're going to be the pharmacist. You're going to make your own pill. Put it all together. And here we're going to use it to do like the eagle did. Now, mankind's lifespan before sin was about 900 years. Ooh. Oh, I think about living 900 years. How many trips would we have to make for Walmart? 900 years. 900 years they lived for. 
Why could they live so long back then? What cut man's lifespan? Did you know the Bible tells us? The Bible tells us, says, number one, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there is no law. Romans 5.13. There was no law. 1,650 years, there was no law. 1,650 years, man could live 900 years or more because sin was not imputed unto him. Sin was in the world, but it was not imputed unto man. So, man did not have to pay for sin. Now, death came not because of man's sin, but because of Adam's fall. Death was inherited by all mankind through Adam. But sin was not imputed to man. Therefore, man was sinless in the eyes of God, no matter what he did for 1,650 years, because there was no law. When the ark set down, and Noah stepped out on that step, God gave him the law. The first law ever given, Genesis 9.50, was given <clears throat> to Noah. And what was it? What was that law? Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Genesis 9.6. 9.6. God gave the death he listed, the death penalty. The death penalty was given by God, not by man. It didn't come as a result of Moses' law. And you know, <clears throat> Romans chapter 11 says, The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. The death sentence is in effect today for willful murder. God himself gave that first law. At that moment, sin was imputed unto man. And sin began to kill man so fast that God had to put a boundary around man to keep sin from killing him until his appointed time to die. That boundary was an appointment that God set for mankind. He gave him an appointment Therefore, that kept sin from killing him before that appointed time to die. Otherwise, sin would have killed him quicker because it kills the physical body and it kills it quick. Well, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans 11, 29. What, gave God, what God gave is here today. Man tries to revoke the death penalty, but he'll never do it. You see, God will forgive any sin, say two, blasphemy the Holy Spirit and worshiping the Antichrist. Those two he won't forgive. The others he will. He will even forgive the sin of murder, but he won't forgive I mean, he'll forgive the sin of murder, but there's a consequences for the act of murder. Yeah, exactly. The consequences has to be carried out. Even the Supreme Court of the United States ruled on that when Andrew Jackson was president of the United States because a soldier who had committed murder was sentenced to die by firing squad, and he had been a loyal soldier with General Jackson in the army against England at New Orleans, and the warden of the prison was one of Andrew Jackson's officers. And this soldier had become so converted that he had converted everybody in prison. And the warden pleaded with Andrew Jackson, who was president, to pardon him. And Andrew Jackson went to the prison himself. He wasn't prone to pardon people. But he went and talked to this soldier, talked to all the other prisoners. He was convinced that it was a genuine conversion, and if any man deserved to live for it, this guy did. And he offered him a pardon. And the man asked for time to think it over. He didn't accept it right away. And after he thought it over, he told him, 
God had forgiven him for his act, of, for his sin of murder, but he must pay the price for his act. And therefore he turned down the pardon. Well, the warden and other people appealed all the way to the Supreme Court to try to have this man escape his execution. And the Supreme Court rule of pardon, not a pardon, until it's accepted. It must be accepted. And the soldier refused to accept it. Therefore he died. Had his own. Strange, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, it is. Let me tell you about what I learned about the eagle. Now, I went to a lot of places to look this up. Most information contained about the eagle, of course, was, was uh, come from uh, John James Audubon, the American Eagle Foundation. And then the uh, Cuyahoga Indian Library, the library system of New York State and the library system, public library system of Mississippi. We went through all of these to get the information that we got about the great bird, the eagle, the American eagle. He lives to be a hundred years old, this eagle. When he's about 45 or 50 years old, he begins to grow weak. He's going, he's got to the top of the hill. You know, we talk about people good over the hill now. Yeah. Over the hill again. Well, he gets to the top of the hill at about 50 years of age. <coughs> and he starts downhill. His feathers grow loose. His claws begin to grow loose. Even his beak gets loose. And he knows he is nearing his time. He's nearing his time. But now this eagle, when he started his life, when his mom and papa pushed him out of the nest, and the way he went to live on his own, he looked for a mate. And when he found that mate, they united. And they will live together forever. They will never, he will never mate with another eagle. She will never mate with another eagle. If one of them gets killed, the other one reigns a widower or a widower until the end. They'll never go with another eagle. They stay together and they don't associate with other eagles. Just those two. Only time you'll catch more than two eagles in one nest is when the eggs hatch. And then only until they can shove the children out of the nest. They're there, those two. When he reaches about 45 or 50 years of age, he knows he's about to die. He's reached the top of the hill and he started down. He heads for his graveyard. Did you know the eagles have a secret graveyard? Just like the elephants. You'll never walk through the mountains, through the forest, through the hills, and find the carcass of a dead eagle that died a natural death because they die in secret. They have a secret graveyard. And they go to that graveyard. He goes to that graveyard and he sits down in that graveyard. That begins his fight. The great test is underway. When he sits down, those feathers fall out of his wings. He can't fly. He can't fly now. Then those claws fall off. He can't walk without a great deal of pain. Then that beak falls off. He's really in trouble. He needs that beak to pick up his food to put in his mouth. But now he's going to have to eat or he's going to die. And he's sitting there all alone in that graveyard. Once every day, his mate will fly over that graveyard. She won't land. She'll fly over and she'll drop a morsel of fresh killed meat once a day. That's to be fresh killed. See, when he's in strong health, good health, no thing, he'll eat any kind of meat just like a buzzer. But when he's fighting for his life, it's got to be that good stuff that God's going to furnish for him, you see. Just like the Bible said. So that means his mate has to go hunt for breakfast every morning. And she's got to kill something every morning. And she brings it and drops back to her mate and keeps going. He's got to get to it now. If it's very far away, he's got to walk. He ain't got no claws. And that's painful for him. But he's got to get to it or he's going to die. 
So he struggled. He struggles to get there. Then when he gets to it, he starts picking up without a beat. You get it in his mouth. Well, I have to do it or die. So that means do or die. He's putting forth all kind of effort. He's using every ounce of strength he's got, every bit of energy in his body. Every day, this ritual goes on. This process goes on. Day by day. It might go on for weeks. It might even last for a month or more. But this process is going on. See, he's going through a great test. His patience, his endurance, his ability, and most of all, his dependent upon that mate to bring that food. See, just like we depended on God to furnish us the good things that we need day by day to make it through. This eagle is struggling every day. He's struggling every day. One day, one day, he noticed those feathers were beginning to sprout. He started uphill now. And he looks. Now his claws are beginning to sprout. He's even growing a new beak. And each day, little by little, he's getting a little stronger, a little more confidence, a little less pain when he walks, a little easier to pick up his food. Till one day, one day, he can spread his wings and soar. He's back now. He just bought for himself 50 more years of life. He has really renewed his, his strength. His youth. Not only his strength, his health, but his youth. <coughs> He's young again. He's just like he was when he set out on his first 50-year journey. Now he's setting out on his sixth, his second 50-year journey. He has renewed his youth. Can a human really do that? Then he is gracious unto him that deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child. He shall return to the days of his youth. Job 33, 24, 25. Here's a man that struggled through more, I guess, than anybody else in the Bible. And yet, what did God give him? And look at old Naaman. You remember Naaman? Uh, the general who uh, almost blew it when they told him to go to the River Jordan and dip himself seven times. The River Jordan, that muddy old river, he said. I was looking at the picture of River Jordan on the History Channel the other night. It sure was muddy. And just think about John baptizing all those people in the River Jordan, you know? Putting them down in there. And he was looking at them saying, when he's coming over the hill, oh, and a bunch of snakes and vipers. Who warned you to free, free from the wrath to come? I can just see him in my mind as he put them under the water, you know? Somebody hollered, let him up! I can't wash it off. <laughs> but he knew what they were. Well, they sent old Naaman over there. And you know, the prophet of God never even come out of the house to greet him. And that really called him. He was a commanding general. He really was. But finally, his own people persuaded him at least to try what the man said. He went down in the River Jordan one time, two times. Three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. And he come up, and the Bible said, the skin like he did. Just as clear, he had renewed his skin. Yeah, you know, we can, we can learn a lot <clears throat> if we just look at things we don't want to pay any attention to. Take, for instance, animals. And, and you know, see, God set up a berry around their life too. He gave them a lifespan, just like he gave us. The eagles a hundred years. If he makes it through his test. If he knows his life's only fifty years. But if he makes it through his test, if he renews his youth, like most of them do, now his mate's gonna have to go through the same <coughs> process that he did. Because he's gonna be a little bit older than her, and after he makes it through, then she's gonna have to go through that. 
and he's going to have to feed her just like she fed him. Be always a depending on each other right there to make it through. Just like we we depend on God. Now you take, for instance, uh, <coughs> uh, the average lifespan for uh, a dog is about, what, 16, 18 years at the most. Uh, a horse, about 20 years at the most. Um, they say an elephant can live for 100 years, and tortoise maybe close to 200 years. So these were boundaries that God placed around their life just like he placed around us. Uh, <clears throat> we take the lifespan of a human. It, it says that in, uh, the average lifespan would range from 70 to 80 years. According to Psalms 90 verse 10, it says 70 years and then 10 more years if we persevered. But the opportunity, uh, according to the verse in, in Genesis 6-3, was for 120 years. Now, do we know anybody that really made that? Well, we know that people in the Bible did. It was a, there was, I was giving this lecture somewhere one time, and a physician was in the audience, and he asked me, do you know any human being in our day that did that? They did that. Well, I do. How about that? You know, I sure do. And here I have a picture of him, and... If you can find a wrinkle on this 117-year-old man's face, I'll give you a dollar. Pass it around. 117 years old in 1998. In 1998. <clears throat> 117 years old. Pass it around. Take a look at it. And you know what he did? Just like the eagle. He had a place where he went over the hill and came back. He went over the hill and came back. Like the eagle went over the hill and came back. Because he believed God's word. He preached his first sermon when he was five years old. Five years old. He lived. He ate. He chewed. He swallowed this word every day of his life. That was in 1998 when he moved to my state. He moved from California to my state in 1998. He was 117 years old. <clears throat> that newspaper article authenticated his birthday. And you can't find a wrinkle on him. Look at him. His skin's like a youth. That's what he claimed. He renewed his life. And every day he repeated See what we've been talking about, saying those words, how important they are? He repeated that verse of scripture that I just read to you. That uh, uh, Job used, that was given to Job over and over. That was his favorite verse of scripture. And he said it to himself every day, every day of his life. He spoke life into that body. He spoke life into that body. I was born 78 years ago. I was a very sickly child. I was a yellow kid, what they call sinus. I had to live on some old stuff that was supposed to be iron in it called Groves Chill Time. Every day of my life, I had to take it. I was sick, very sickly kid. Skinny. Nobody expected me to make it the next week. But God was merciful to me even then. And we finally overcome. And then I developed sleep acne. Another potentially fatal, uncurable disease. Until the day the aneurysm got me in the ambulance. When I was 54 years of age. I had gone over the hill and met my appointed time to die. But by the grace of God, I came back. Amen. Last year, I went to my doctor because a lot of people wanted to know just how, what kind of condition I was really in. <laughs> there it is. Any doctor, Dr. O'Neill can read it, but you can look at it and see what the doctor said. He says, not because of me now, 
but because of this word and because I believe and practice what they believe and said. You see? He said <clears throat> he had football players, athletes in there anywhere from 20 to 35 years of age, none of which was in as good condition as I was in. That's what that doctor who gave that examination said. <clears throat> Not because of me. Because of this. Because of this. Now look at Brother Glenn sitting over here. He's 200 years old. <laughs> look at him. <laughs> He's in better health right now than he was when he was 21, except for that one little thing. Well, you notice that man of... Beg pardon? Of course it's going. <laughs> of course it's going. You see that man's picture that I passed around? The only thing he gave in to was that pair of glasses he's wearing. 117 years old, and you should see him preach. He was jumping like a 16-year-old kid up there. And he was a hellfire and brimstone preacher. Telling all them people, you ought to be in the same shape I'm in. But you're sinners, he said. That's why you're not. <laughs> I mean, he was telling the people in church that. He didn't mention his word. So there is hope, even for us sinners, aren't there? Glory to God. Well, <clears throat> now, what is the question? What is the answer to the question about God's will concerning healing? Is God's will, really, for healing to take place today? The scripture proves what God's will is about healing in more than one way. First, by the, his own pronouncement, exactly what he said. And said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give air to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of those diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Amen. Exodus 15, 26. Now what's he talking about? The diseases he brought on the Egyptians. Well, the same thing I showed you before. What he killed them for. Yeah. With catastrophic disease. And he sent demons to do it. So demons can spread disease amongst the population. No question about it. Demons can spread disease. Now, we see God said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Yes. I will heal you. I will cure you of your disease. Okay? So that's got to be his will then if he's going to do it, right? Yes. Right. All right. Now, his will was manifested through his son, Jesus Christ, our God in the flesh. Jesus said he did only what he saw his father do. Right? Yes. Okay? And the Bible said, now when the son <coughs> was sitting, all that they had any sick with diverse disease, Brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Amen. Luke 440. Now, that had to be God's will, or Jesus wouldn't be doing it, right? Right. All right, so it was God's will for healing. Now, did God commission his church to carry on the very act of healing? That's what we'll know. Did he commission his church? Now, let's look. Now, Peter and John went up together <clears throat> into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked them alms. And Peter, fastened his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which set for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Acts chapter 3, 1 through 10. So we know the church was commissioned. How is the church supposed to carry on the healing ministry? Number one, by the laying on of hands. Does the church do that today? Very important. You see, he says, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, 
and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way of thy comings, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 9, 17. Number two, confessions of known sin and having the elders anoint with oil and pray the prayer of faith. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he had committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. <clears throat> James chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. Using its own spiritual gift that was given to the church. Now, not only was the gift of healing given to the church, specifically through the elders, there are, the Holy Spirit can give the gift of healing to certain individuals. But you don't have to have the gift of healing in order to be healed. Because it is, it is given unto the elders of the church to anoint with oil and pray over them the prayer of faith and he will raise them up. He will raise them up. <clears throat> Why then do some folks don't get healed? Well, this has been a question. I was preaching last week over in Texas. A man over there who who everybody testified to had the gift of healing. Just about everybody he laid his hands on and everybody he prayed for was healed. And yet he said to me, Brother Ted, I don't understand why some people can't get healed. Just, what's the reason? Why can't they get healed? I said, well, I, I've seen that too. I've, I've, I've been traveling around the world and I've been in a lot of healing services and a lot of delivery services. I've found people that just don't seem to get healed and, and, and seemingly on the surface and godly people, good people. And yet they can't get healed. <clears throat> but you know, I said, remember, remember Paul's life? How many people was healed by him? Even they just put the, the prayer claws on his, on his body and, and went out and touched other people and healed and delivered them, set them free, cast out spirits. And it, it, it healed all there. And yet himself, God would not heal. Well, he says, I can't, I can't believe that. I can't believe that Paul didn't get healed. I can't believe that, that God would use him to heal people and not heal him. I said, well, the Bible is very plain. He didn't heal him because it was a demon specifically put there by God for a specific purpose. Unless God specifically tells you you're not going to be healed, don't cease yes. in your effort to be. Because persistency, remember, is part of that gospel. And God loves persistency. He gave us two great examples of it in the Bible. Remember the unjust judge and the widow that wouldn't leave him alone until he gave her justice. And remember the man who had to get bread at midnight from his neighbor? Kept knocking on that door till he got the bread. This is what God, he loves persistency. So, uh, it, it, how long was it before Abraham saw his blessing? But he never doubted it. He never denied, not denied it. What did Romans chapter 4 verse 17 say about that? Call those things that be not as though they are. As Abraham did for how many years? 25 years. But every day he said, I'm a father of many nations. Praise God. I'm a father. That's when anybody says to me, he says, how are you feeling today? I said, you yeah, better, I couldn't stand it. Yes. You call those things. And you know, when you limp away, they might say, look at that liar going there. But you're not. That's right. You're not lying. Because right. if you believe that in your heart, it will be what you say. Right. It will be. Living proof floating around the room. I'm living proof of it, right? Not because of me, but because of this word. Amen. This word right here. Amen. Glory to God. There is healing waiting. Well, I began to do some research. Why? And I wanted to find people that had been in the healing business for years and years and years and see what they had to say. And I went to some notes that was left by Dr. Dan, 
Dr. Donald C. Stamps, if you know him, or know of him, he's dead now. He's going on to be with the Lord. He was one of the great Pentecostal theologians of the 20th century, Dr. Donald C. Stamps. Honored in many places. And he left in his notes what he believed scripture supported why certain people wouldn't get healed. And I copied his notes word for word. And this is what he said. He said these were the reasons that he found in scripture for the many people. Oh, he didn't say many. For the people who, godly people, good people who never seemed to get healed. But many of them God used as inspiration for other people, even in their in their uh, condition, they were so outgoing and so positive in their speaking, everything that they really was a great example for other people to persist. He listed as number one reason that he discovered was unconfessed sin in the life of the individual. As long as there's unconfessed sin in the life of the individual, no matter how much, it's God's not going to do it. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5, 15. That was the scripture he used. Also, there's another scripture. It's uh, Psalms 68, I think that's where it's at, where it says, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. So that's unconfessed sin in your heart. God will not hear you. So for that reason, we, we have to be sure that we have turned loose our secret sins. Now sometimes turning loose our secret sin is not easy because in order to engage in secret sins, we have to justify them to ourselves. Our, our own conscience will destroy us. So if we're engaged in any kind of secret sin, we have convinced ourselves that it's not a sin. Otherwise, if, we, it's, if we're ongoing in it, uh, our own conscience will destroy us. So it behooves us to become a detective <laughs> about our own commitment condition. If we have, or if we engage in secret sin, which we have convinced ourselves that it's not a sin, but God's not going to hear us because we're regarding iniquity in our heart. And for that reason, that is one of the reasons that Dr. Stamps listed. Number two was, he listed, was demonic oppression or bondage. People had not been totally clear, set free from demonic Bondage. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Luke 13, 11 through 13. He listed as number three, fear or acute anxiety. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not into thy own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thy own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil, and he shall be help to thy navel, and marvel to thy bones. Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 8. He listed as number four, past disappointments which undermines the faith in the present. And oh, I've seen that so many times. I've heard so many people say, say, just mingling with the people in the audience before church and listen to him talk to them and he says, well, I don't know. I, 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 I've been prayed for so many times, you know, and, and nothing has ever happened. And you know, you, just, you can just, you just expect that they have that attitude. And you, you just watch when they leave, they're going to leave like they came. <coughs> because they're expecting to leave that way. They really are expecting to leave without a healing because they had been they're so disappointed by by so many failures in the past 
The Bible said it had suffered many things of many physicians and has been all that she had and was nothing better but brother grew worse. Mark 5, 26. Then it says, And a certain man was there which had, had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. John 5, 5, 7. So we see, and then he listed as the fifth reason, the interference of people who don't believe. He said, and many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried, the more great deal, the son of David, have mercy on me. Mark 10, boy. If he had listened to those people, he would never got healed. Uh -huh. He would never got healed. Because they tried to discourage him from calling on the Lord to heal him. And he listed it as six reason on biblical teaching. Teaching that was not in line with the scripture. Teaching that people bought. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth, and he said uh, unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life or to kill, that they held their peace? And when he had looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he said to them, Stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole. as the other. Mark 3, 1 through 5. You see, all these people had been taught you can't heal on the Sabbath day. And they were there ready, ready to accuse Jesus. He listed for his eighth reason unbelief. <coughs> the unbelief. Isn't that something when Jesus won't be one? The seventh reason? Excuse me, I did miss it. All right, that's important. So the seventh reason was failure of the elders to pray the prayer of faith. And that is a very, very important reason. I should have saw that by the way, but that's what he lived. Failure of the elders to pray the prayer of faith. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. If you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. And many churches don't believe in anointing with oil. I was on a tour of France one time, and some people come up and ask to be prayed for, and they wanted me to anoint them. But I used to carry a little bottle in my pocket of all because they didn't have any in the church and I went to use it. The pastor called and called and said, don't do that. Don't you do that. Yeah, we don't do that here because we don't want people to think it's magic. We don't want them to think it's oil. Well, the power's not in oil. The power's in obedience. It's in obedience. This is what he said. Anoint them with oil and pray over them to pray yeah. of faith. The oil has no healing power. The power is from Jesus Christ, and, and, and it is uh, it is being obedient to him. Number eight is unbelief. Unbelief. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and, and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but his own country, among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And one about the village teaching, Mark 6 3. The Lord of Lord came to him. And they wouldn't believe him with him. Why? Because he was the carpenter's son. They saw him grow up. They knew that he worked in a carpenter shop. They knew all the family there. He said, and he wants to heal us. Who do you think he is? See. Number nine, carnal behavior. Right. For he that eateth drinking unworthily, eateth and drinking damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. First Corinthians 11, 29, 30. Dr. Stamps has spent his life. He was one of the, I mean, one of the greatest recognized 
Pentecostal theologians in America in the 20th century. In fact, he has all of his notes is in uh, one particular Bible. I forgot to, I have that Bible and I can't even remember the name of it right now. But uh, he did all the notes in that Bible and other things. Wonderful, wonderful study book by Dr. Stamps. Number 10, <clears throat> he said, there are some times the reason for the persistency of physical sickness in godly people is not readily apparent or will not be known in this life in certain incidents. And uh, the scripture he used for that is 2 Timothy 4.20. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first. Galatians 4.13. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thy often infirmities. 1 Timothy 5, 23. <clears throat> uh, but uh, these are some of the scriptures that he used to say there's certain... See, they didn't understand why Timothy was never healed. And didn't understand... Uh, we don't understand... Well, we do know why Paul was not healed, because God told him specifically he wouldn't be healed and everything. Now, Dr. Stamp says that there is a time and a place for proper medical care. Doctors don't heal. They assist the body in its healing process. Jesus healed. Sometimes through an instant miracle, and other times through a process of time. We cannot always choose the way God heals us. But we, if we have faith, we can choose to be healed. However, he said, no matter how many times we're healed, always comes a time we have to die. But, do we want to die like Moses? Do we want to be able to walk to our grave? Why would we want to renew our strength? Our youth? Why would we need uh, of course in this troubled time we're going in all the trouble that's about to come upon us with the great tribulation Jesus said Matthew 24 that in the last three years of existence here on this earth on the time we know there will be tribulation such as man has never seen before or will ever see again. Why? Why would we want to be here when that's going on? Well, maybe we won't. Maybe we will. Who knows? But if we will, it's not only that. Because we know we're living in a day and time when all of these great national disasters occur. Just look about us everywhere. Uh, we see all these things occurring. The Lord let me live through one of the greatest disasters that ever hit this nation through Katrina, this Hurricane Katrina that just hit the Gulf Coast down home. Well, in one nursing home in Araby, Louisiana, 100 people died in that nursing home in their bed. They couldn't get out of bed. They drowned in their bed. Have you been in a nursing home lately? We're there and look at the people that are warehoused there, yeah. don't know they're in the world, yeah. Yeah. just like little babies. Yeah. When we came into the world, somebody had to clean us, yeah. somebody had to feed us, yeah. somebody had to bathe us. Yeah. We couldn't sit up, we couldn't get up. If water would have come in our little crib, we would have drowned too, wouldn't we? Because we had no, no ability to take care of ourselves. These people had no ability to take care of us. They drowned in their bed. One hundred of them. They couldn't move. We saw all of this great national disaster like uh, we've never seen in this country before. In the state of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, 10 million people were displaced. 10 million people at one time. As that 32-foot wall of water came over uh, out of the Gulf and went over and fell on those houses and crushed them like match rock and then swept them right back out in the Gulf and the people that was in went with it. Went with it. Because they didn't believe uh, that such a thing was going to happen. And it did. And it tore down the electric light power. And you know, people are used to turning on the faucet and getting to drink water. But you don't realize when there ain't no power, there ain't nothing to pump the water, there ain't no water there. And it was August 110 degrees. 110 degrees. My house, we had 12 people came up from New Orleans. I lived 100 miles from New Orleans. And 12 people came up out of New Orleans from my house, in my house. 12 people. 
12 people, my wife and I, live by ourselves. You know how much food we had in the factory control to try to feed 12 people? 12 people. Because the electricity went out, we had no water. Well, it just so happened. Uh, our house is all electric. It just so happened that the little water system I was on had a generator. So they quickly started up that generator, and we got water. And we were one of the only few people in that whole county that had water, that little water system we So they came with great big water trucks to, to bar water from our system all the way. But there were people 110 degrees, uh, just 24 miles from us, in a little town called Petal, Mississippi, uh, waiting for FEMA to bring water in. First truck got there three days, three days after all power was out. For three days, they didn't have any water to drink. People with little babies, people with children, you didn't have three days. And so when they announced the FEMA truck was coming, they lined up for miles, miles. They lined up to get one gallon of water. And when the truck was empty, they closed the door and drove away, and all the rest of the people still standing in line. They're going to wait till the truck comes tomorrow. Be first in line. But by then, those people that got the gallon, they're back in the end of the line now because it's done gone. When the truck comes in the next day, you got a line twice as long. And when it's empty and they slam the door, you got all them people standing there waiting. One man killed his sister over a gallon of water. He did, it was an accident, but he killed her, uh, trying to take the gallon of water away from him. Because he said, my children's got to have water. And she said, my children too has to have water. And he tried to take it away from her. And when he jerked her, she fell near her head on a rock and killed her for a gallon of water. For a gallon of water. Never say you wouldn't do it unless you stood in those shoes too. Amen. This is the gun. How am I going to feed 12 people? A uh, house all electric, no stove, no stove, no store open, no, no service station to buy gasoline, no way to travel, nowhere to go, not even a loaf of bread. Two of them, little babies, 12 people to feed. You know how God took care of them? Oh, what a wonderful God he is. What a marvelous God he is. You know how he took care of them? <laughs> Sometimes I'm ashamed to tell it. <laughs> He did. See, I didn't know why, but did you remember the big scare about uh, Y2K 2000? <laughs> Everybody was advised to go buy groceries and hoard them up because a great disaster is going to happen in 2000. <coughs> well, I went and bought the groceries and had them here out there. Uh, <laughs> I didn't need them in 2000, but I needed them in 2005. <laughs> and they up people. And that's how God fed those. 12 people. That's how he fed those 12 people. Praise God. Praise God. The first step, before you start on your road to total recovery, you must know without failure, the first requirement is the helmet of salvation. Your name has to be in that book. These promises are not made to the general population. They're made God's children. If you belong to him, if you believe him, if you obey him, I guarantee you, you can make it too. Amen. You can make it too. Because who am I? A boy he took out of the cotton patch. That's all. A boy he took out of the cotton patch. A boy who was born sickly, who lived sickly all of his life, to the very day they say he was dead in the end. Many people who visited me in that hospital room are now dead, and I'm still here. Not because of me, but in spite of me. The hope of this message is that it will inspire you to persist, to follow those words, to be with your life, what you say you are with your mouth, when you say, I am a Christian. Be one. Let that light shine. And let everybody see it. You become the light of the world. And that, of course, is what your enemy hates. And the first thing he's going to try to do is put out that light. And every time he strikes, he can buffet that flesh. Every time he strikes, he wants to open it up for sickness. Remember what God said. I am 
the one that healed you and all your disease. Greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in this world. Amen. In spite of our weakness and our failures, God still loves us. Amen. He still loves us. Praise God. He died for me. Yes. He died for you. Yes. Salvation is personal. Yes. It's personal. There's no two people in this room alike. So that meant salvation had to be a personal thing for every one of us. Every one of us. And we all came to the foot of the cross equal. Didn't care if you was a king, if you was a governor, if you was a president, or if you was a beggar. When we arrived at the foot of the cross, not one was one bit better than the other. We were all equal. And we received that gift of salvation. Free to us. But it cost him. It cost him. But for us, it was free. Now we turn away from the cross. And we start. That's where we got our ministry. Every one of us got a ministry that day. Every one of us. And we turned away from that cross and we started. And he ordered our steps. He put me where I'm at. He put you where you're at. But on the way there, we were building rewards or depositing bank accounts in heaven, so to speak. Now we're going to give an account for every grain of sand in that sand time that has passed. What did we do with that time that he gave us? That's what we're going to get to count for. My hope is that you, if the Lord tarries long enough for you to preach on your 117th birthday, Amen. just like Reverend Johnson Amen. was doing. Amen. I know Glenn will. <laughs> Amen. Amen, I know he will. Amen. The Lord has blessed him, and he's blessed me beyond the wildest imagination. In the 20-something years that I've traveled around this world, I've never, ever had to ask anybody for anything. And yet, I've never missed a night, never failed to find a place to sleep, Never been stranded, although I was stranded for a week one time. <laughs> but God brought me out for nobody else. But I was just, I was stranded in back in Africa, back in a uh, Muslim village called Bachi in the nation of Nigeria, because they found out we were Christians and they wouldn't sell us food, they wouldn't exchange our money, they wouldn't help us anyway. And we sat there for a solid week, waiting on the Lord. All right. But on the way over there, my wife had the forethought of packing in my suitcase a big box of teddy grams. <laughs> <laughs> so we lived the week off the teddy grams. <laughs> and then somebody some Christian was brave enough to volunteer to take us out of there. And the Lord brought us through all of it. He brought us down. And I was confronted with one of the greatest tests of my ministry then while I was over there in a little town called Josh. Josh, Nigeria. When we got out of Bachi, I thought everything was fine. <laughs> Glory to God, we, we got to a town where they had an airport. Now I can get out of there, you know, because they had an airport in Josh. When you go back to Bachi, when you leave there, if you go any further, the mode of transportation is by vine and swing, you know what I'm saying? That's the only way you can travel any further. On the way to Bachi, we stopped in this town. We flew into the little town called, there was four of us, three, uh, uh, two, Americans and two uh, Nigerian. We stopped in this little town uh, called Josh because that's where we flew into. We were on our way to meet with uh, uh, 20 pastors that came out of the jungles that were in the the uh, operating secret churches in the in the uh, Pagan's camp. 
and uh, we were going to meet with them. And uh, we stopped in this little town. Josh and the uh, a British subject, oh, well, a soldier, had done a soldier. Great Britain was the last protector of Nigeria. And when the British soldiers pulled out, he stayed and took up Nigerian citizenship because he married a Nigerian lady. And uh, he formed a chapter, a full gospel businessmen's chapter in Josh, Nigeria. And on our way through, he said, will you, will you, can you come back? Will you speak to my chapter? And I said, I'd be glad to do it. So when we did get out of Nigeria, we knew that we had a, to stop in Josh because I was going to speak there. And so he announced it. He advertised it all over town. He printed up little bulletins and handed them out, whatever means of communication they had. But there was five witch doctors in that town. Everybody in Nigeria is scared of the witch doctors, <coughs> terribly afraid of them. So these witch doctors announced to the people they would not permit that meeting to go on. That they were going to control it. I didn't know that. He was afraid to tell me, afraid I wouldn't speak. So he didn't tell me. When I arrived, when we arrived back in town, the whole town was there. I said, gee, all them people come out to hear me. <laughs> No, they came out to see the fight. They knew it was going to be a fight there because the witch doctor said it wasn't going to happen. I didn't know it. And they took the front row seat. They were sitting there with their arms crossed. Looked like statues, all five of them. I come in, they put my chair right next to the rush, just like this. He got up and he made his little speech and he introduced me. And, you know, I could see him sweat. <laughs> it was in Africa, so it was hot. So, but he, he sweat a little too much, but I didn't have any idea that it was because the witch doctor was sitting there. And he introduced me, and I went to get up. I couldn't move. I froze like a block of ice. I couldn't move. And I'm saying to myself, what? what What's wrong here? What's going on here? What's the matter? And I reached up and caught the nurse with my hand and I pulled myself up out of the chair. And I eased over like this. I put my arms on it. What the hell was I doing like this? I hold myself up just like this. I'm holding myself up and said to myself, Lord, Lord, what's wrong? What's the matter? And I went to speak. I couldn't say a word. I couldn't say a word. And I said, oh, Lord, you brought me here. Yeah. You got to do something now. Yeah. And I began to whisper. The longer I whispered, the stronger I got, the louder I got. And then I'm standing up. I went right on. Never know. I didn't know what was going on. I just keep saying to myself, what happened? Because you see, I had been confronted three times here in America with the same thing. But it was no problem at all. I, number one was at the uh, was at uh, Ball State University where they had witches COVID and a Satanic uh, the temple come against me and advertised to all the students that they were going to control the meat with mind control. I didn't even know they were there. Same thing happened to me in uh, uh, Pontiac, Michigan. When I went to high school there, opened a course they called white witchery. And the PTA invited me to come and tell the people what white witchery was, what the devil really was. And they advertised in that town. They wouldn't go in to speak. But none of these places, they, they never interfered. I mean, it's played in this country. But let me tell you, when you go to Africa, yeah. those people got power over there because the devil is there, you see? Mm -hmm. He is there. But it didn't take, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't really a whole minute that they had me froze, but it seemed like a week. Yeah. It seemed like a week. Because I'm puzzled. Had I known they were there, I would have knew what was happening. But I didn't know they were there. And I didn't know what was happening. But God pulled it through, so it, it didn't last a minute, but I felt the power then. But I felt God's power too. Yeah. Yeah. And how great, how great it is to know Him personally. Yeah. Personally. I've had the privilege of sleeping on straw beds and leaky roof. He always furnished me a place to sleep, no matter where I went. Not because of me. 
comes by me. He sent me, and wherever he sends me, I'll go. He told me, if I received an invitation, accept it. Put it down and get to it when you can. If it's not from me, he said, I'll close the door before you get there. And if it is from me, no man will close the door. Yes. So, yes. That's the way it's been yes. all these years. And every year he calls me up. He asked about the first day of December and says, what day are you coming? <laughs> I have to tell him what days I'm coming, you know. We've been doing this now 20 something years. 20 something years by the grace of God. The message tonight was designed and has been designed to try to build confidence and faith in the listener. First, that God is real. Second, that he does heal. Satan is real and you have the power over him. And the sickness and disease that we have to put up with in our life is a result of the attacks of the enemy. That he is there every day. We must remember that this is warfare. That we're in war every day of our life. But God is the commanding general. If we obey his orders, he has laid out the battle plan for us. And if we follow the plan or the steps that he's ordered, we will be victorious. And like Bishop Johnson, we can preach a sermon on our 117th birthday Amen. if Jesus persists. Renew your strength like the eagle. Amen. God said it's possible. Yes. The eagle does it. Job did it. Naaman did it. Bishop Johnson did it. Yes. Man did it. We can do it. Praise Amen. God. Praise God. Amen. Would you stand with me while I pray? Amen. Father, thank you for this hour. For these words, Lord, you know the purpose of this message tonight was to instill in the hearts of your children the determination, the faith that's necessary to win this greatest of all battles. Just look how the eagle struggled. Oh, how he must have suffered. Yet he persevered and he soared one day. He soared in the air with a new life before him, just like we can for this ministry and we will be able in divine help as we walk in divine help to be able to counter any attack that the enemy may mount upon us or our nation in this great onslaught that's taking place today thank you father for everything you've given us for the word most of all that we might that it might be a lamp unto our our path as we go forward i lift up my brothers and sisters to you all of those that might be under the sound of my voice tonight who might be hurt in any way as an elder of your church and i am appointed by you therefore lord i come just like, just like i touch them with my hand and i anoint them in your name and i pray over them the prayer of faith lord you said the prayer of faith will raise them up i believe that and i am not uh, i am not guilty of failing to do it as an elder in the church i stand here tonight i pray that prayer of faith over every person in this room that might be hurting in any way or might be bond in bondage to any demonic spirit i declare you spirit a defeated foe right now in the life of these individuals set them free father and show them that you are the god that healeth them in your name amen amen, amen. amen.